online chess tournament. Sad that OTB is not back yet, but we're hoping that it will happen soon. Yeah, um, really hoping that we're live and that we got things going. Um, some exciting uh, games we'll be talking about today and one quite recent game as well um, that was played in the uh, our very own Magnus Carlsen tour, which is really cool. So uh, let's just make sure we are live, but I trust we are, definitely trust we are. The topic today will be um, background checkmates, as you guys know all too well. I've been background checkmated over the board in so many tournaments online. It's just insane. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing really, really well. Alrighty. So the first game that I really want to show you actually comes from uh, the second day of the Mag Magnus Carlsen Tour final. And it was between, of course, Magnus and Hikaru. Hikaru was unfortunately on, on the back foot with this game. Let me just see how many moves this game had. Let me see. Uh, not many. I don't know why it's only showing nine moves. What? That's impossible. Okay, we'll see how far we get with the game and then uh, continue. Okay, otherwise I'm going to have to go and import the game from the database, which I don't mind doing. Uh, alrighty. So what I'm hoping to do is go through the game and then stop uh, at that point where you guys will look for the background checkmate or the combination thereof. Yeah. Okay. Magnus Carlsen. To a games. There we go. Chess event. How have you guys been finding the the games of the tour so far? They've been very topsy turvy. And uh, did they reach Armageddon? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> there we go. It had, let's see. E4, E5. Knight F3, Knight C6, Bishop E5. So it was a Ray Lopez taking Berlin defense. I bd two. Let's see if it was this one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Day two. But it must be so tiring for them, to be honest. I don't know. How do you guys keep uh, fit during a chess tournament? Because I know... Um, in order to be prepared for a chess event, you gotta be physically fit, you have to be mentally fit, you gotta be psychologically on on the same page, you know? You can't have your mind drifting all over the place. Uh, it wasn't that one. That one. Nope. <laughs> there we go. The Blitz. I have found it. I love this game so much. I would have been so sad if I didn't find it. But anyway. Technical difficulties are all the rage these days. Okay, it wasn't that. Import PGN. There we go. All sorted. All right, so let's go through the game. We have e4, e5, knight f3, 
knight c6, bishop b5, knight f6, capturing, and d3, bishop d6, knight bd2, bishop g4, h3. I don't usually like allowing my opponent to put the bishop on g4, so I play some like uh, early h3 to just stop that. But of course, theory here. Knight is well repositioned. Look at that knight. It goes from... Let's use an arrow. It goes from g8 to f6 to d7 to f8 to be probably positioned on g6 or e6, right? That is insane. That is just crazy. Okay, continuing. Yes, hi. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am uh, Jesse February from South Africa. Knight f5 and knight e6. So the knight went to e6, g4, bishop g6. Now I take it uh, black or queenside castle. Queen d7, queen c2, long castle, and long castle. Then we have an f f6, just solidifying the pawn on e5. King b1, king b8. Then we have a d4. Breaking open the center, of course. Taking on d4, rook takes d4, bishop takes h5, doubling up the rooks. And this was a rapid or blitz? Queen c6, bishop to d5, rook e7. Okay, controlling the 7th rank. This bishop is just a complete monster, I think, on, on, d, on e5 here. There we go. Bishop to d6. Locking bad rook on d7. Oh. Okay. So this is where we stop. I'm going to take away all the highlights on the position. The move that was made was queen e4 by Nakamura. Nakamura was playing white pieces. Carlson was playing black pieces. And here it's black to move. What move? Did black play? It was blitz? Okay, cool. Great. Exactly. Good job. No Armageddon's yet. When do the Armageddon's uh, start? Well, there were the results today. I wasn't. I uh, didn't see the end result. Nice. Good job, guys. Is the Twitch chats alive? You guys there? Knock knock. <laughs> Threatening to take it. Exactly. Exactly. Totally agree with you there. Oh, you saw the game live. Well, that helps. It definitely helps. And, you know, at some point we're going to look at um, a game from 2002 and 2008. Then you can tell me if you were seeing that game, uh, those games live as well. Um, I, I definitely didn't see any of the games live. Um, but when I stumbled across them, I was, I wasn't disappointed. Goodness. I even have one game with Judith Polga, so that's pretty cool. Let's reload the chat. So yes, it's only one move here. Only one move. Nothing too schmancy. All the games will just kind of stop at that point and it'll be like a one mover. It'll be a one mover. And uh, Then we'll get to the combinations. Any of those games from 2008? Yeah. Neither was I, don't worry. I think the first online game I saw, I was 16 in 2013. 
2013, I watched the World Championship between Magnus Carlsen and Anand. Actually, I watched The Candidates earlier that year. Must have been. And that was the first time I saw um, Anand and and all the top players as well. And then he won The Candidates and played uh, Carlsen later that year. Was it 2013? Or was it 2014? I can't remember. But I know... Um, must have been one of the years, one of those years. Okay, so here, of course, you found the answer, and it is to move the queen to a4. Exactly. And what does queen a4 do? It attacks the rook on d7 and threatens back rank checkmate. So don't feel bad. Even the top players in the world make mistakes. However small, they do make mistakes, so it's completely human to make mistakes. So let's move on to the next game. This game was played between Topalov and Morozovic. I really admire uh, Morozovic's style and like... Oh, good evening, Kapi. Um, his style and the way he presents himself and the way he carries himself as well. He He's, he's scary. If I ever had to play him OTB, I would be terrified. And the one game I watched, um, the video at least, watched them play Blitz. And he was playing against Alexander Morozovic was playing against... I, I don't know if I'm botching his surname, by the way. Uh, Carlson, and it might have been uh, two, 2012 or 2011. I have a lot of these videos saved on my computer. Uh, back when I, I didn't have easy access to internet, I used to watch binge watch Blitz videos all the time and like look at how they moved the pieces and how quickly they moved them and aspire to do exactly that. So that was definitely what I spent my time uh, doing instead of school homework. Yeah, don't recommend. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so let's go over it. Topolov was playing uh, Veselin Topalov. Topalov? Topolov <laughs> was playing white pieces and Morozovic was playing black pieces. Let's see. So we have another e4, e5, and a Rilo pairs. Bishop goes back to a4, bishop c5, a4, rook b8, c3. So the normal structure of Rilo pairs is just to uh, play c3, d4, control the square over here, d4, and retreat the bishop from, from b5 usually to a4, and then b3, c2. And then to control the diagonal over here, usually targeting h7 later on, depending, of course, on the position. Um, and what I like to do is just set up something uh, small in Blitz and Bullet. Uh, it obviously doesn't work in classical games if you're playing against someone who is equal to your level or much higher rated, where you're just kind of putting pressure on the h7 pawn. I've made this mistake OTB, where I underestimated the how strong the combination of the queen and the bishop were on this diagonal. And I was like, oh, well, I'm defending it with my knight on f6 and it's not going to be bothering me at all. Later on, I was forced to move my knight. Um, otherwise, I lose the knight. And if I move it, it's checkmate. It's not a, a rabbit hole you want to go down. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. D4, bishop b6, capturing on b5. And then knight a3. I like knight a3. I like knight a3. I don't know if you guys saw the previous streams that I've done, um, but there was one game where uh, Anand was playing. Was it Anand? And he came up with a novelty. It was a novelty where he played knight a3 in that line. So if you look back on the videos, and uh, it was really cool to to see such a novelty, and we tried to ration with it as well, um, with no engine, of course. Taking on b5. Bishop g4, bishop c2. There the bishop goes to c2. Probably just to defend, putting extra defense on the e4 pawn as well. h6, and taking. Ouch. I really don't like it when there's a bishop on g4, putting pressure on the queen, especially with this pin, and then there's more pressure. With a knight on e5, or... In, in some openings where the knight goes to d4 when you just feel really uncomfortable with this kind of pressure. So all you want to do is place extra defense in the knight. If the bishop can retreat to e2, usually if it's on c4, you want to do that. Um, 
and you don't want to ruin your king's side. So if they capture, you really don't want to take back with a pawn, especially when your king's on g1. That's... Hi guys, really good to see you. <laughs> good afternoon, chest trope and RP Cody. Good to see you. A dim night. I guess uh, if you can justify why your knight is on the rim of the board, then it's okay. If you plan on repositioning it or using it um, to attack something, then it's fine. But if you're just putting your knight on the side of the board for the sake of putting it there, it's not a good idea. Or any move for that matter. Like if you're making a move and it doesn't have any reason, then it's not a great move. You're just like, well, I don't know. I couldn't find anything. This is the usual response I get while analyzing games. I don't know why I moved there. It looked nice. Um, but then we have to we have to learn how to ration with our moves. I moved here because this is what I was planning. I moved here because I'm attacking this. Um, my piece wasn't very active on the square, so I repositioned it to where it could be of better use. Of course. <laughs> Jan Gustafsson said, Knights on the room are pretty dim. Interesting. Very interesting talk yesterday in Chess24. Yeah, we spoke about co-chess. Um, I was a little in awe because everyone who was kind of there in the conversation with me, um, I pretty much idolized. So it, it was very nice. And uh, I mean, when I was younger, I used to watch chess lecture videos. Like I said, I, I binge watched Blitz videos and chess lecture videos. And that's how like as a junior player, among the other junior players in my region, I was relatively strong. And now looking back, I definitely wasn't as strong as I thought I was. But uh, watching those uh, chess lecture videos with like Jesse Christ speaking, and then finally being able to meet him all these years later, it definitely, it was difficult to be myself. <laughs> but um, it was a lot of fun and it was it was great to get to, to know them and speak to them and hear their thoughts on on certain topics and I really hope that we do the chess talk uh, Shazam again um, well it's a new show that we're trying out and chess talks you know we'll see <laughs> the amazing preparation by Ukrainian team <laughs> I mean <laughs> uh, yeah okay sure Lila told you to are you listening to an AI? I, I don't know if you should listen to an AI. An AI should never tell you what to do. Unless it's an engine telling you uh, a tactic that you've missed. Moves without purpose. Exactly. Like, I'm going to be super cheesy right now and compare it to life. You're not just going to do something and say, I don't know, I just felt like doing that. Like... If you make a very big decision in your life, it's going to be based on actual thought and, you know, decision making. You're not just going to move to a different city because you felt bored in the previous city. Like, OK, I'm moving to a different city because maybe it has better prospects. My friends are there or something like that. Right. You're not just going to make an impulsive decision. Unless you do, then I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Why GMs play like that, we can't understand. Well, with chess experience comes intuition. And I think that if you have um, the knack for chess intuition, you're bound to make decisions over the board that sometimes you can't explain, but are relatively good decisions, maybe an exchange sacrifice, that you just feel like the position demanded, for instance. You love some moments of the show. Why only some moments, chest open? And which moments were that? I assume there's a reason for one E4, but I kind of just play it. Well, Torlek, I can give you a number of reasons why E4 is a good idea. But I don't want to bore you with opening information when we're here to talk about background checkmates. <laughs> I didn't look starstruck, so... If I didn't say it, nobody would know. 
well, I'm glad I can keep a poker face. Chess has definitely helped me gain that skill. If there's a city with free chocolate, you're moving. Switzerland? Don't they have like tons of chocolate? Like the mountains there are made out of chocolate, right? Just like the moon is made out of cheese. Life is like a box of chocolates. If we're quoting Forrest Gump, I don't know how far down the rabbit hole we've fallen. Moving on. So defending the knight on f3 uh, with the other knight on d4, which is a very nice maneuver. I don't know um, what white could have done if he didn't have knight d4. I would have been very uncomfortable than maybe trying to fill up the, the gaps if the, the g-pawn had to capture back um, after bishop takes f3, maybe, or knight takes f3, g takes, and then getting maybe the bishop to f4 and tucking it in on g3, just to kind of act as a pawn and say, okay, I'm trying to keep my defenses in check, you know. Hey, Jirachi. Belgium has free chocolate. Then uh, I'm on the first flight to, to Belgium. Watch me. <laughs> okay. Moving on, d5. Of course, when you're putting pressure on your opponent's position and your opponent starts defending, that's when you want to kind of throw all your forces uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the position, like the center. You'll want to bust it open, create some open files. I would have half expected a move like c5 in this position, but probably it's not as good, right? So, c5. I'm missing something obvious, I feel. But nonetheless, d5 was played, taking on d5, queen takes, and now there's even more pressure on the f3 square. Okay, so I'm going to make uh, the defense yellow. The attacker is blue. Today, we will create a rainbow. There we go. So, okay, another defender. Three attackers, three defenders. Probably going to be better for black because after the pawn goes to f3, you're left with an isolated pawn on the h on the h file, double pawns on the f file. The king will be open, but I think the queens will be exchanged, so it won't be in as much danger, maybe. Okay, h3, and the bishop goes back. The bishop goes back. What happens if the bishop actually takes? Then knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes. Maybe you just wanted to keep the pressure, right? If he had a pawn on d4, then he couldn't have played knight d4. Therefore, one d4 is bad. I hear you. I, I like the last part. I don't know if I can ration with the first part. <laughs> Some moments were kind of embarrassing. Embarrassing. You're gonna have to write a whole explanation for that just trip. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm not an expert or anything, but develop pieces normally attack the center early in castle. I can't agree more. Those are the opening principles. You have to control the center, put a pawn in the center. After a while. Yeah, I think it takes a little bit of getting used to. At first it's like, oh my goodness, is this really happening? And then you realize it's happening and you're not really dreaming. And then you, you go back to normality, right? Knight takes. This is intense. Okay, so knight takes g4. You often see this kind of thing. And obviously if pawn takes, then bishop takes and the knight on f3 is lost, right? So knight takes on e5, takes... And queen takes h5. I love this. Okay. And there we go. Did I not say this? Queen f5, putting that ultimate pressure on the h7 square. We spoke about this. The knight on f6 is no longer there. And I mean, this is just beautiful. Well, for white at least. Knight f3 check. And that king is, is feeling it. Queen takes. Bishop takes. 
and bishop f6 just getting uh the bishop to safety rook a7 because rook on the seventh rank is equivalent to perhaps winning a pawn um that's at least what i what my coach told me growing up when you put a rook on the seventh you're bound to win a pawn and uh i believe there's a whole chapter on uh, the seventh rank in aeronyms of it, my system i definitely recommend that book you can get a hold of it it's probably on chessable i love chessable's whole format where you're reading a book and all the positions are just there for you so you're kind of reading the text and you can move around the pieces i really really like that It was a nice thug life you did. It is necessary to put more salt in wounds. Are you talking about when I was referring uh, to the 2200 game? I was just repeating what was being said. Um, the whole... I guess my whole point of being there was to, to take points that, you know, that they've said or brought up. Because I thought what they were saying was gold. And then reiterating it and adding questions to it, right? <laughs> how often does putting a bishop on a nice diagonal pay off or is the threat enough are you talking about the pin it's always beneficial because when you are pinning a piece uh, that piece becomes paralyzed and um, if it's a relative pin like the one we saw on the queen then the knight could move but it just means that the queen will be lost then at some point you can put pressure on that knight and make it very uncomfortable for your opponent. Then I would say black's king is definitely safer than white's king in this position. And the pawn structure... I mean, black has a better pawn structure because of the pawn islands, right? Two pawn islands for black, uh, three pawn islands for white, and the fewer pawn islands you have, the better it is for you. What? Um, a joker, uh, you know, the point of the stream is to keep it family friendly. Um, and just to let you know, guys, that I am referring to two different chats, one from YouTube and one from, uh, the Coaches Twitch. Um, but y you should really keep it PG. I, I guess, uh, that book has influenced, uh, the greatest of nations. Yeah. Anyway. Coming back c5 <laughs> bishop e4 knight back to e5 and rook d1 okay then we play they played uh okay the morozevich played knight c4 and uh bishop b7 bishop g5 Trying to exchange the bishop. Probably also realizing that maybe the endgame has a better prospects here for for black pieces. What I'm assuming. A uh, b3, right? Knight e5, rook d5. I think we're getting to that point now. I just need to know where to slow down already. So in this position, we have rook takes c5, just picking up a pawn, rook e7, and here rook b5, black plays, knight takes d3, and I'm going to put the audio off of desktop, then all right, so here we have white to move. White to move. What are you guys going to do? And don't forget to give others a chance as well. It's just fixing my color. Oh my gosh, really? 
King G2. Okay, so this is uh, concerning the topic that we're dealing with today, Cappy. And the topic is, if you see at the top, that side, at the, the top left hand side, um, back rank checkmates over there. So this is our topic. That's what we want to focus on. Interesting. Seeing a lot of different moves. Rook A8. Is that the only reason you've chosen that move chest open? Because it is the theme. Did I fall into a trap then? No. Minecraft. Yeah, we're definitely referring to Minecraft. I think Joker just misspelt Minecraft. But you can't play chess in Minecraft unless you build yourself a chessboard. Yes, because it's the theme. If it was not the theme, you would not give that move, of course. Self-explanatory. Must I show the notation already? Yes. So the answer is, of course, bishop to e4. And this is what we are threatening. Rook takes rook. And also bishop takes knight. So what happens if black plays rook takes rook? What happens if black takes the bishop with the rook? Well, I think the best move here is actually rook takes bishop on e4, uh, leading to rook takes rook check and king h7. But if the rook were to, let's use yellow, if the rook were to take the rook on b5, what happens? What does white play? If it was an endgame lecture, then you would play king g2. Makes sense. But you shouldn't base your answer on the topic of the day. You should base your answer on the given position. King g2 is horrible. Okay. Yeah, rook a8. Then we play rook a8. And even if the rooks come back, it's still going to be checkmate. Because it's, it might as well, there might as well be a black pawn on h7, and that initiates back rank, right? So here the bishop is... I'm getting TTS from a different channel, this is not great. Okay. Alright, so bishop is covering on h7 there. Okay, very nice. Very nice, let us move on. This game was between Aronian, Levon Aronian, and Gelfand, Boris Gelfand, in 2008. This game was played, also using the theme of back rank. I want to sneeze, and I'm trying to hold it back. My goodness, okay. And Aronian played white pieces, Gelfand played black pieces, so let's take a look at the game. Rook takes e7. Well, I mean, material is important, but activity over material, right? So we also want the checkmate over material. When you win the game, you win all your opponent's pieces, if you really want to look at it that way. But winning an exchange doesn't guarantee a win. It doesn't. But it does guarantee you a better chance at winning than if you were to be equal or down in material. So I definitely agree with that. D4. Aronian play d4. Aronian is also a well-known uh, c4 player, right? He is a, a renowned c4 player. <laughs> I mean, you can't play a chess game and watch the chess stream. It doesn't work that way. Yesterday I was playing a normal three minute, two second increment blitz game and I was watching television at the same time and I don't recommend. Even listening to music is not recommended while playing chess. You're meant to have complete dead silence and playing your game and you should focus on the game solely because when you analyze the game, this is 
you playing. Of course you want to play the best game possible. You're not going to want to analyze a game that you've lost on time in a winning position. I was a queen up, by the way. And it's horrific. You don't want to do that. Okay, so let's get back to... <laughs> Sorry, coach. That's right. <laughs> get in line. <laughs> I'm kidding. Aronian is very creative. Would you say uh, Aronian is a positional player more than a tactical one? But to be a 2800 in any caliber, I mean, it's quite a feat. You must be good at everything. <laughs> B3 protecting the pawn on C4, bishop D2. And I would say you get an English kind of setup anyway, Catalan, depending. C6 bishop, C3. It's not a move you see every day, but probably the knight wants to go to D2. D5. And knight e5 is a nice central move for the knight. Um, I would say that a knight center and a pawn center are definitely two of the best kind of centers. Because if you put your queen in the center, it can easily be attacked by a pawn or minor piece. And you don't want that. So um, a knight is very difficult to be kicked off unless a pawn comes along like f6 and a pawn center, of course. Even if um, it is contested, you don't have to move the pawn. There's really no reason to. But here, knight e5 is protecting c4, so if they take, you'll just take back and the bishop will be no threat to c4. Knight goes back to d7. Like you were saying, the only thing that can kick a knight off is a pawn. Oh, and he decides to take, okay. Taking back, and knight d2, doing exactly the same thing, just protecting from d2 here on c4, castling, castling, rook c8, and e4. Love to see it. Wait. Right, so if the pawn takes, then it's no longer threatening c4 anymore. I really like white's position. When my opponent plays a setup like this, I feel very annoyed because it's strong. It's like, it, it does everything it needs to do. It controls the center. Your bishop is just kind of eyeing down that diagonal over here. I'll make an arrow. Look at this. As black, you feel uncomfortable. Even if you have some counterattack like c5. What happens after that? Taking on d5, potential IQP, maybe, yes, no, oh my gosh, they are steamrolling these exchanges here, and knight takes rook e1, can't play chess without music, why well, I'm saying, okay, I really enjoy listening to music as well while playing chess, so I should actually practice what I preach, but in actuality, it's better to not because you're preparing. You have to constantly have this like frame of mind if you want to play OTB that you will be playing a tournament. And when you're playing a tournament, you're not going to hear any background noise unless there's a function right next door. You're not going to hear uh, music while you play. Um, what was told to me when I was at school is when you're studying something, eat gum or an item of food that you would possibly be able to eat while writing an exam. So whether you write, if you're writing an exam and you're able to snack, then eat that particular item of food when you're studying because you're bound to remember more, um, associate uh, maybe notes or knowledge with taste. Strange sentiment, but interesting. So maybe if you like a certain aroma, or if you're eating a certain food that you eat during a chess game. Do that while you're playing Blitz or do that while you're studying chess and maybe you're bound to remember more. Because I know a lot of chess is based on theory and remembering theory and that's what masters spend doing, studying theory, theory all day long. Right? Unless I'm wrong. <laughs> you can't do that unless you're Hikaru Nakamura. <laughs> Did it work with the... Okay, it worked with gum. But, okay, I didn't put it really to the test. Maybe I should have tried a little bit more. But I studied and I did okay. Of course, if you don't study, you're not going to do okay. <laughs> yeah, hey, burrito. Maybe you could eat burritos while you're studying chess. Okay, I love diagonals now. <laughs> did you not love diagonals previously? Look at this bishop, it has the whole diagonal to him, to itself, right? Okay, queen takes. Obviously, uh, when the queen is in the center or any file 
uh, for that matter, you kind of want to put your rook on the same file, whether it's directly hitting it or not. So already in my mind, I would want to play a move like rook d1, where you're kind of hitting the queen on d8. Even though the knights are in the way, you will move this knight, and then you will be pinning the knight on d7 and later putting pressure on it. So it's nice to always eye those kind of files. That what That's what needs to like spark up in your brain, that I need to put my rooks on a file that is attacking the queen indirectly. Because even if it's not attacking the queen, that queen will feel pressured to move. So let's see if that happens here. Okay, moving the knight first. Bishop c4, moving the queen back, hitting on uh, g7. Bishop f6, taking, knight takes. Knight e5. When are we going to see rook d1? Now? Yes, we do. We see rook d1 hitting the bishop and uh, seeing the power of the bishop on g2 as well. <laughs> For that to work, you have to study, and I didn't. You can't just eat food and expect to remember uh, facts you did not study. Yes. Learning with emotion. Learning with food, that's conditioning in psychology. Another way to condition uh, your brain or motivating yourself to kind of work on your chess is uh, with every chapter, you kind of award yourself uh, with something. Or you could say with every 30 minutes of work, chess work that you do, you give yourself 10 minutes off, which does not work, I must say. What kind of gum do I recommend? <laughs> I don't know. It really depends on you. Everyone's taste buds are different. I like a very strong gum, like menthol or uh, peppermint. I don't know. <laughs> I used my book as a pillow. It worked a couple times. There was a video of uh, this kid in a classroom and he needed to study for a test that he was about to have in class. Very young kid. So what he did was he took the book, he opened the book, okay? And then he literally scooped, scooped the information up from the page and did this and is like, now I have the knowledge. He turns the page and he's like, let's do it again. <laughs> so that was, oh, that was just adorable, first of all. Oh uh, my gosh, I, I really wish it worked, but it doesn't work. Can relate. Yeah. Different flavors for different concepts. Yeah, maybe that works as well. Queen a5. See, the queen felt pressure to move away from the file. Bishop takes d5. The knight takes, let's see uh, how far we are from where we need to be. <laughs> okay. So here, we can actually start here. It's um, white to move. What move do you think white would make here? There's only two moves left of the game until um, uh, black resigned, actually. <laughs> oh, you watched the video, nice. So you guys tell me maybe what move would white play in this position? Queen b7 is interesting. Nice, nice, nice. <laughs> I only have one suggestion so far. Queen b7? Hmm. Keep the suggestions coming. Oh, my name is not Julius. Julius Barr is the education partner and sponsor of the World Online Schools Chess Tournament. I'm sure it's just regarding the training. But my name is Jessie. I'm Jessie. 
as you can see here at the top, uh, presented by Jesse February. That's my full name. When I say interesting, it's wrong. Well, no, it's genuinely interesting. It's attacking the knight on d5. It's not the move that was played. It's not to say that there's a correct... Uh, I'm sure there are a few moves that are okay here. Yeah, there are a few moves. You want a hint? Imagine asking for a hint in a real game. Or the Olympiad players asking for a hint. Um, nudging their, their teammates saying, Hey, you've seen my position. What should I do? 97, I like 97. Yes, 97 was played. And then over here, rook d8 was played, and now it's white to move again. What does white play? And this move caused black to resign his game. Morozay Verge, um, who was not playing, <laughs> Boris Gelfand. It was Boris Gelfand uh, who resigned in this position. Yeah, I can't recall ever seeing a game between Aronian and Morozovic. Boris Galfand. So here, the last move, of course, considering the topic chess trope, and this is your uh, clue, it's back rank checkmate <laughs> that we're focusing on. Queen e5. I love it. Nice. Good job, guys. Exactly. So it's queen e5, which is amazing, because this is what causes opponent to resign in this position. Here we're threatening the knight. The knight can't move because we'll pick up the queen, and there's no way for the knight to move to defend the queen. And of course, if the rook takes, we just play. Queen e8, sacrificing the queen, because after rook takes, then we just take with the rook checkmate. And that is the background checkmate theme that we were looking at. Very, very cool, huh? Exactly, Queen E5. Nice. Alrighty, and this was the Judith Polky game that I really, really um, enjoyed looking at. I want to see if I put the information in the top um, or if I imported it. Yeah, it was between Judith Polga, you can actually see, Judith Polga and Avenji Bereyev. Cool. I was certain I was wrong. Well, you weren't wrong. You were right. So Judith was playing white pieces against Avenji. E4, E6, D4, D5. And uh, I mean, it's really, really great to see the French on the board, but it's really sad to think that the French did not make it out alive uh, in this game. But let's take a look. Judith was a fierce attacker. Judith is my spirit animal. <laughs> Yeet. Evgen. Evgeny. It's not Avenji? Evgeny. Eve. Jenny. Evgeny. Yev. Yevgeny. <laughs> I'm going to give up. Her games always feature in solving tactics. That's why she she wrote amazing books. I even have one of her books with me under a pile of stuff that I haven't sorted out in a while. Ah, my goodness. Judith Polga. How I beat Fisher's record. And I know there's someone in the chat now. Uh, I think Chess Chopin, you've read this book, right? If you're still with us. Chess Chopin's read the book. I haven't made my way through the whole entire book, um, but I hope to finish it at some point. <laughs> G. Yeah. Okay. Moving on with the French. 93, very, very popular these days. I was watching... Oh no, it was the conversation we were having yesterday. And Mikhailo said that 
he enjoys playing knight d2 instead of knight c3 but that knight c3 is pretty popular these days e5 and i also know that on chessable anishikiri made a set of videos he claimed to have made french or the french uh, great again and has taken a supposedly bad opening and has made it good so i don't know you guys will have to review that for me and let me know if it's any good i i bet it is <laughs> That pawn is storming up the board. Pawn a flexing book. It's the only thing I can flex, Cappy. Not my knowledge, but the books that I have. If I could eat the book and have the knowledge, that would work. I play knight c6 here instead of b6. b6 is, is interesting. The reason for b6, well, as a French player, I'm assuming this is the concept behind it, is that you want to play bishop a6. Get rid of white's strongest bishop. And how do you know it's white's strongest bishop? You look at the pawn structure. Here we have static pawns, um, or I should rather just highlight these four pawns. Um, they're going nowhere slowly. Well, at the moment they're static because they're not gonna be moving forward anytime soon. And because those pawns are static, you can tell which bishop is strong and which is weak, theoretically speaking. Since the pawn, the black pawns are on dark, on light squares, that makes the light squared bishop weak and the dark squared bishop strong. Here, black has given up the dark squared bishop, but for theoretical reasons, because it is the win of a variation. And here, white has both their bishops. This one would be considered the weak one because the pawns on dark squares, the dark squared bishop would be limited in terms of range and the light squared bishop would be strong because it can maneuver between the dark squared pawns that are static at the moment. This goes against all I have learned. Only one piece developed and moving almost all pawns. That is why um, growing as a chess player, going from maybe club level to advanced, you want to stick to um, more, I won't say basic openings, but rather that offer a little bit more in terms of like development and just getting the pieces out and the king safe. Um, with the French, there's a lot of theory. And there's not a lot you can do in terms of thinking for yourself when you rarely have to rely on theory in a lot of situations uh, like this, the win of a, okay, b6. And, and all of this, I'm pretty sure is theory. You won't just play h4, h5 because you want to. It's theory, it was studied. So let's see, h6, queen g4. Question mark. Hmm. Play the Reti? The, the, but the Reti doesn't give you the center. You take the center first. Judith was ahead of her time. I think she retired a little bit too soon, right? <laughs> oh, the book I said was Judith Polger, How I Beat uh, Fisher's Record. <laughs> Scooping the knowledge of the books. <laughs> What are the benefits of studying the French except for the surprise element? I mean, I really like the strong structure that you get out of the French. Maybe the c8 bishop becomes a problem, but rather look at it as a challenge and saying, how can I activate this bishop or how can I improve the position of it? Because I really like the, the pawn breaks. First of all, we get c5 and f6. It really it breaks white structure. So it's nice to use as an element of surprise, especially if your opponent isn't prepared to see the French, then... Maybe your main weapon can be Sicilian and the, you know, side element of surprise opening can be like the Karakan or the French. I was just thinking of getting the knight out right away. So starting with knight f3, but if your opponent plays knight f6, you're going to have to end up playing d4 and you can't play e4. That's why I like to start with e4. I thought you were confused. I'm happy you're not confused, Cappy. Defeated someone in the morning with a bath type structure on oh, kingside. What's a bath type structure? 
I don't know what that is. Okay, anyway, moving on. Queen g4. King f8. Theory. That's all I'm saying to really high, you know, top level games. It's just theory. It's a novelty. I've never seen it because I haven't studied chess enough. <laughs> um, it's theory. And you give up the rook in this uh, theory here. Yeah. Oh, there's some annotation. So the annotated line is queen takes a1. Oh, this is what happens if you were to take. And somehow much better for white. Oh, of course, you're just winning the queen. So the whole point of the fact that you can't take on a1 is because bishop h6 uh, threatening a queen takes g7. And after the capture back, then just taking the, the queen with the h rook over here. That's what you're threatening. Of course, I was just testing you guys to see if you saw the same thing I did. Yep. <laughs> so here, bishop a6 was played instead. This is what actually happened in the game. Rook a2. Because... Rook b1 is just not enough. Queen c6, a4, bishop c4, and rook back to a1. Knight to d7, bishop a3, rook c8, knight back to d2. I'm really loving what, what black is doing though. Uh, even though the king is on f8, you don't really want to see that, but castling would have been more terrible, okay, because the bishop was on this diagonal. And if he had castled in that position, if we go back a bit. So for those of you, it's, it wasn't a mouse slip. I'm pretty sure this game is OTB and it wasn't a hand slip either. So king, if the king castles here, I don't know if I can play it without the, the game disappearing. I'll have to test that feature. All right, castling. And then bishop takes h6. And the, the pawn cannot take back because the king is being pinned. And that is an absolute pin. So let's go back. To the game bishop a6 a4 a4 is just not a move you would even consider um i mean instead i mean to be honest i would play a move like bishop d2 just trying to give the bishop more range but here i guess um a4 to prevent the queen from going to a4 <laughs> i don't know let's see a4. Okay. Rook back to a1 and bishop a3. There we go. So now we see the function of a4 much later. It's to put the rook on a1. Okay, because it was being attacked by the bishop on c4. And then playing bishop a3. To put uh, more pressure on the diagonal. Pinning the knight. Um, so of course, pinning pieces takes all the power away from that piece. Knight d2. Attack in the bishop. Capture, capture, rook c1. So rook c1 probably serving the function of... Okay, protecting the pawn, maybe wanting to move the pawn as well. And the future also taking the bishop. What you want to do in a position, especially where it's very double-edged and unclear, then you want to take the pieces, your pieces that are doing a lot. You don't want to capture your opponent's weak pieces. You want to get rid of your opponent's strong pieces with your pieces that aren't doing enough. So technically, if you could take this d2 knight and capture the bishop on b5, you got to make it happen because this is one of black's strongest minor pieces and this is your weakest minor piece. So let's see what happens. a6, c4, taking, taking. And now the knight is strong. The knight is much stronger than it was. Knight b2. It says the best move here is knight e3, but knight b2 has a plan as well, I'm sure. Just defending the bishop or consolidating, I guess. Uh, defending the bishop on d3, let's go with that. e4, oh, e5, f4, g4, h5 pawn structure. The bathtub thing. Hey, Achnoid. An elitist? My gosh. What? 
I don't know the bathtub tr structure. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're just trolling right now. Can't the rook just take the bishop going back to the line where black's king castled? Oh, but the, the rook would be on f8 when you castle. So then the rook will not be able to to take the pawn if it's being castled. Because remember, when you castle, the rook does no longer serve a function on h. Or not only that, but it's no longer there. So it's just on f8, you know. What is this? The game? It's Judith Polger versus... I'm going to have to go back to remind myself. Versus Bereyev. Avenge... Oh, I'm not going to say his name. Okay. I'm not trolling. How many languages do I speak to? I speak English and Afrikaans. Okay, going back to the game. Rook takes, rook takes. And bishop takes, knight takes. Okay, there we see the, the reason for that move. What I'm wondering is why not king e3? Okay, knight e5. King comes back. King f1. Oh, but the bishop is hanging. This is why you retreat the bishop, okay? Hmm, and now we see some things. What does white play in this position? Bath tub is for pog champs. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay, let's see what happens here, guys. Putting my hands in my pocket because it's cold. <laughs> it's winter in South Africa at the moment and the weather has not been kind. So um, my streaming partner, Rebecca, she recently uh, sent me a video, I think it was today, of it like being completely uh, cold in, in Cape Town and it's storming and the rain just won't stop. And everything that happens in Cape Town ends up coming to Port Elizabeth because of it being a cold front it will obviously come this way and you can feel it coming you can feel it in your bones in in, in your granny bones and you can feel it um, I mean just weather-wise it's crazy <laughs> Jan Gustafsson created of course he created it I saw his like uh, analysis of the world champion games that's the first time I saw uh, saw him ever he was sitting in a hotel room in like a robe with sunglasses on in the middle of the night and he was filming videos on his um just his general comments of the game it's hilarious he just doesn't care about anything <laughs> yes very nice come on just joe and you know for sure exactly burrito exactly so rook c8 Knight takes and queen d8 mate. It's exactly what you are after. Good job. So we're going to do a last few tactics. So these are just general tactics uh, that we're going to finish off with. There are five of them. Hopefully they increase in difficulty or it might peak and go down again, but okay. Why to move in this position? What to do? Closest I've ever been to PE was George. George is about 45 minute drive. Radio Yun. Yes, must be Radio Yun. No, I don't have a British accent. This is English, South African English. I don't have an Afrikaans accent. <laughs> Nice, good job. Queen c6, there's something better, Joseph. We all uh, wish to be as funny as as Jan. <laughs> Easy. Always play bishop f1. Why would you always play bishop f1? f7. Exactly, guys. So, got checkmate it in the... Okay. So, you take on f7, rook takes... And then rook check, rook back, and captures. So you're just sacrificing the queen, uh, creating kind of a decoy for 
black to kind of hold on to if uh, black had to make any other move um trying to defend the rook just take the queen and if the rook takes rook e8 i don't think there's anything else if the queen could go back to c8 then it would be much better if the rook just moves away then rook e8 So that's unfortunate there for black pieces. Next one, white to move. What you gonna do? I am from South Africa. No. Do I look Algerian? How long does it take to be an IM for a beginner? I started playing when I was eight. I only rarely started taking chess moderately seriously when I was about 16 and then achieved WIM when I was 19. So three to four years, but it doesn't matter. Like time is just unimportant when it comes to uh, chess improvement. Depends how many hours or how much effort you put into your training. Because you could be putting hours into chess, but you're not working on the right stuff. For instance, if you're spending 12 hours playing bullet, you're not going to learn anything. Maybe you'll just get better at bullet, but you're not going to gain any chess knowledge along the way. If you pick up a book and start reading, then chances are you will improve for sure. You can be world champion like Steinitz at 60 years old. Yeah, sure. I will be... Oh, was he 65? I will be world champion at 70, mark my words. <laughs> Knight h6, what happens after pawn takes knight h6? The rook battery is doing the job, I like it. I had two years due to COVID. No, like... COVID is the best thing that can happen for a chess player because first of all you're forced to stay indoors second of all you have all the material in the world at hand and you're not distracted by other things or other people you just kind of isolate yourself and work the best thing is to work under the radar and then pitch up a year and a half later at an OTB tournament and just crush everyone that's a strat I want to try out one day No tournaments to gain rating. But remember, rating means nothing if you don't have the skills or level of chess to back up your rating. You could get an easy, lucky boost of rating, but it's not going to reflect your um, your strength. Yeah, so knight h6, pawn takes, uh, rook takes, rook, exactly. And now we just play rook f7, mate. Good job, guys. Next one, black to move. Everyone will be underrated. Now we're talking about just about every tournament in India and a lot of tournaments in South Africa. You don't see a lot of FIDE rated tournaments in South Africa, but the level of chess these guys are playing is just insane. We're at the southernmost country in Africa. To get out of here and play a tournament or to import good players or very strong titled players to either train us or play against us i mean it's hard to find right they're gonna be a ton of sandbaggers <laughs> oh my gosh you have zero rating but your strength is high just tripping Are we on the same page? Oh, so the the numbers and the letters aren't showing in the position, but the bottom left hand side is h8, the bottom right hand side is a8, and then the top left is h1, and the top right is a1. Good job, you guys are seeing this relatively quickly. <laughs> King Kong, great name. A 
<laughs> Cagnus Molson. Interesting name. Not knight g3, actually. Not knight g3. Because if you go knight g3, king will just go back to g1. It's not the quickest way to end the game. Sorry, Cappy. It's good to work on the notation, you know. I had two Tesla shares in return. Totally, if you can get me Elon's contact, I'll contact him right now, have him on stream, and uh, be like, yo, Elon, you, you wanna, you wanna learn some chess? Come on stream. You guys have something better? There is. There is. It's actually a checkmate in three. So you guys, uh, oh, I flipped the board. Okay, you flipped the board, okay. I don't know if I should flip the board because it's black to move, so you want to see it from black's perspe perspective. Some of the tactics, actually, it's a good idea to look from your opponent's perspective and solve it that way. Um, it would help you see your opponent's ideas during a game, which is what you have to do. So that's a nice way to improve as well. The lesser known ways to improve. The Anastasia's mate. I read that it's Anastasia, but it's Anastasia's mate, exactly. So here it's knight e2. You were right. King h1. Now you gotta sacrifice the queen because this is pretty much a back rank as well. Back rank on any uh, uh, corner of the board or kind of edge of the board. And here there might as well be two pawns over here. Well, not really because rook h5, the knight is defending or kind of covering h uh, g1 <laughs> and g3 and after rook h5 this is mate uh with the king on, on on h2 there okay two more to go let's go back this one should be fairly easy right we'll go through really really quickly yes Cagnus molson Which opening do I prefer as white? I mean, I I used to really enjoy the Scotch Gambit, which is nice as like a secret weapon. Also play during Blitz. Um, I like the Italian. I've dabbled with the Ray Lopez, but don't play it often. The side rank, exactly. <laughs> exactly, queen takes d8. Rook takes, and then you have checkmate. You give up the queen, and you get checkmate with the rook. That's the really cool thing about back ranks. And then the last one. Let's go. Oh, we've done this one already, so we've finished. We are done, guys. Thank you so much for being here. I know we've gone a little over time, but I just want to thank you um, so much for your jokes and your comments and just your general interaction um check out coachess.com if you want to see our wonderful coaches and read more about them and of course good luck to all the participants of the world online chess championship world online school chess championship see you guys very soon bye <laughs>